This is not that algorithmic as the ethanol particle is more than this is maybe not the best to be able to present to an audience. But no, please be open. So this is the plan for the talk. Of course, I will give you a very long introduction. Okay, so uh, mostly it's analysis, you know, a lot of calculations. So instead of you know uh, taking you through the calculations, I will give you the motivation and the background of you know, what these calculations, how they came about. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the, the main thrust of the new uh, analysis is you know, some kind of marginal inequality. And I will demonstrate uh, using you know, the evolving example of the uh, Then I will discuss you know, some more complicated settings you know, uh, without giving you too much uh, details. You know, stay with them. And then uh, end with you know, some kind of some lower bound arguments to see if the analysis can be improved. Uh, so talking about again, uh, speaking about the topic, you know, uh, it's, it's a little anti-thematic uh, uh, that you know I, I chose not a very recent trend, but I chose to revive the past trend. Uh, to some extent, you know, I was reminded when I saw this that I'm actually digging up this. You know, it's, it's a you know, the, the, the basic framework, you know, was conceived around mid '80s. Okay. And you know this problem was quite hot for about ten years, and then people felt that no, I mean they petered out. I mean they, they wanted to solve the problem, they made some progress, and it appeared that either you know people are losing interest or you know it seemed too difficult to solve. I would think that it's a combination of both, because uh, my last conversation with uh, uh, Yadka Matushek was about this uh, this problem back in the late nineties. He was interested to solve this. He also made some progress before. <laughs> so it's about basically, you know, uh, trying to revive something that was vested uh, more than 20 years back. In fact, uh, when the paper was reviewed, you know, a couple of uh, reviewers claimed that it's very surprising that no paper had written on this for the last 25 years. So whether or not it's worth it, <laughs> I'm hoping. So uh, I, I've plucked it out from the internet, so I've written this copyright thing, hopefully the organizers won't be in trouble if you make it public. I didn't take permission. Um, okay. So this is actually a framework which is so common and so simple and so intuitive that people often uh, don't realize that uh, the value of it or that it can actually give you very good dividends. Uh, so it's called the framework of randomized implemented construction, where you know, in, in a very abstract setting, we are trying to construct something. So it is, it is, it's actually became more popular in the geometry community. So you know, often we uh, we construct some geometric objects like you know, a complex star or a Bonnet diagram or an arrangement. You know, even things like linear programming. So that that thing to basically maintain a certain property. And you add these objects, <coughs> substitute the right construct, maybe you add the points to construct a complex cell, or the points to conduct a formal diagram, or you're trying to maintain inductively the optimal point you know, in a given set of objects. Okay? So you just do this, you know, this obvious thing to do, thing to do, to do that insert the next object and you know, update the partial construction, starting from the empty okay? So there is nothing very deep about it. And uh, if you look at it first, you probably feel that it's too simplistic you know, to be of uh, any value as it be, in the sense that you know, probably can't be anything efficient. And, yeah, you're right. So the total time, so it's a very, very abstract setting. Uh, the total time you know, spent in this construction okay, is the sum over uh, the time it takes for the IF step. So this total time in summation is. Now, the, the twist is that, well, it's probably going to depend on the sequence in which a root insert object. So the cost of the i step, it's like if you think about quicksort, because that's an example that I think you're all familiar with. It depends on the kind of papers that you're choosing one after the other. In fact, I will also uh, uh, discuss quicksort in the same setting, although we don't think about it as, as, as an incremental construction. So, the sequence in which I'm adding the objects actually determines the final running time. Okay. 
Now, I've seen the sequence is good if the total time is this. That's what we want. But then how do we know which sequence is good? Again, the obvious thing to do is randomize the sequence. Okay. So if you randomize the sequence, then I can look at the expected running time okay, for all the possible choices of insertion. And we can assume that you know, we are actually without any bias, we are just doing the inform distribution. So all the permutations are equally like. So then the expectation is essentially over all permutations for any input set. So it's worst case over input, right? Normal and parameter inputs. The worst case for any input set. Now, this is a very general and abstract algorithm. So let me quickly show you, you know, how we can think about which sort also in the same setting. Uh, so suppose these are the elements that we're trying to solve. X1 through X11. So initially, so this, of course, is a sorted set. We don't know what the sorted set is like. We're going to basically choose these pivots, right? And when you choose the pivots, basically, we're going to uh, bring in some partial order. Yeah. The question is how we maintain this partial order. So initially, we have, we can think about it like a single interval, basically, minus infinity to plus infinity that contains all the bounds. And as we go on, I choose the next pivot, this interval splits. So when the interval splits, basically, you have these two, two subsets, smaller than, greater than. Okay. Now, so the initial interval, minus infinity plus infinity, now has been split into two intervals. And this goes on, right? This goes on as you pick more and more pivots, basically, you refine those intervals. That's basically you're getting more and more partial order information. So now you can see why I'm, I'm saying that this can also be thought of as a, as, a, as a incremental construction, that as I pick the next pivot, basically, some, uh, the sum interval splits. Okay? And these intervals are being maintained in some kind of very simple data circuit. We just just say you know, this kind of thing, where every interval corresponds and contains all the elements uh, within that interval. And then when the next pivot is picked, uh, is picked you know, some interval splits. So incrementally, basically, you are refining these intervals. Right? And you go on. And the, the question is that when you pick the next pivot, okay, how much work is being done? And that is what I was saying, that if you pick the pivots in a, in a way where, you know, the, the, the splitting is happening more or less uniformly, we know that the fix of is very well. But, you know, if it's skewed, then it appears to be bad. So the sequence in which you are picking up the pivots eventually determines what is the right value of the So there are many analyses, you know, at least, Ten different kinds of analysis known for the expected time of quick sort. But before I do that, let me, so since we are looking at a very general framework, it's not just the quick sort. So here, quick sort is rather simple in that you know, just the kind of data structure that we have to maintain the partial construction is basically how do we keep track of these intervals induced by the pivots. But it's also very simple. The next time there's a pivot, basically one interval splits, so we have to maintain this information between which interval contains which elements. Okay. And we'll see that. Uh, but I want to actually uh, generalize this setup where I'm introducing a few notations. You may or may not want to remember all of these things. Right? Hopefully, you don't need to know all of this. So, the first thing that I'm saying is this pile of n is a set of subproblems defined by n objects. The subproblems is basically you think about the partial construction of okay. So the subproblems basically means that these the intervals uh, that split these elements. Okay, so uh, these are the the subproblems that are basically now we have to define further by choosing the <coughs> Normally, we think about which sort is recursive. Yes, it's also recursive, but I'm just taking this perspective that it's incrementally something is getting refined. Okay. So this set of subproblems is basically defined by the intervals induced by the pivots. In general, 
this pile of n will define what is the set of subproblems. Okay, at any 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 uh, intermediate set. And a subproblem is defined by some so sigma is a subproblem, which is defined by what I'm calling B of sigma limits. So in, in the in the context of Pixar, uh, a subproblem is an interval that is defined by the two endpoints, the two pivot elements that define the interval. And L sub sigma, well, here I've written size of the subproblem, it will be used interchangeably, not just, just the size, but also the elements themselves. So I'm not I'm avoiding further notation. So basically, all the elements that are contained within a certain sigma or a subproblem, then these are three elements contained in the sigma. Right? So that's my L sigma. So basically, there is a subproblem called sigma, there's a set of subproblems, and each subproblem is defined by some elements, that is B of sigma, and there are certain elements that define that subproblem, that is L sub sigma. So these are three parameters using which we are going to you know, set up the analysis for that abstract table. So all this was known, this is nothing new. So this is, as I said, this, this world goes back you know, at least two or three years. So like I said, Quicksort basically has at, uh, n, n elements. So you can put, you have potentially n choose two intervals. Some of the intervals will show up as you do the construction, some of the intervals may not show up. And the subproblem is defined as this is what we'll see. So going further, just to make the distinction, when I said n choose two subproblems, actually at any intermediate stage, after I have chosen i pivots, there are all i plus one subproblems. Okay. And throughout the course of this construction, okay, you're not going to see n choose two subproblems. Right? Every time you insert a new pivot element, okay, the number of subproblems increases by one. So what is this n choose two that I'm talking about? So it is the potential number of subproblems. So if I, this is the intermediate state, and the red ones are the pivot elements I picked up, these are the, these are the sub problems that I'm really interested, interested in. But according to the definition, okay, even an interval defined at this point and this point is not consecutive, that is also a potential sub okay? So when we do the analysis, we keep track of all these potential sub problems. <coughs> and uh, what we will crucially use in these constructions, I mean, the, in the analysis, is that the number of potential subproblems that is pi of n, the it's called a configuration space, it will be polynomial in size. So that is something that will be required in analysis. Okay, so in, in, in Pixar, you know, because there are at most, you know, the n points can define at most n to intervals, it's clearly polynomial. For some other problem, geometric problems, it is not all that obvious. But if the analysis goes through for all those settings, in fact it is related to something called z dimensions. So once you have uh, if you have the finite easy dimension, you can show more or less in a polynomial configuration space. Uh, so I've seen this pi zero of n has a special significance, where essentially the size of the subproblem, sorry, uh, so L sigma is that how many of these sampled objects okay, lie within an interval. So this interval doesn't have any other sample number, okay? but this one does and this one does. So the active ones are the ones that does not contain any uh, sample points, and those have some special significance that we refer to their pi zero of n, because these are the ones that define subproblem. This is not quite a subproblem in the context of sort and in other situations also, you know, the empty <coughs> subproblems, empty means no other, because there are potentially so many Subproblems, but we are only interested in those subproblems which does not maintain a sample point. This has some special significance. And then you know people worry about you know what is the maximum size of the subproblem in the sample. This is a purely sampling question, okay? And uh, just to give you a uh, sense, what is the maximum size of the subproblem when we have chosen about our sample points? Okay, on the average it is an over R, right? In the, in, the, in the case of Pixar, it is just a one dimension problem, it's easier to, to think about it. And what you can prove is something very close to that. It's like a constant times n over R times the fudge factor log of R. Okay? So the probability that it exceeds this quantity, that is almost the best possible is n over R, if, with the fudge factor log of R is as equal to half, and you can actually further improve the probability you know, by choosing other constants. 
And this bomb, some people may recognize as essentially the Epsilon head bomb. So this is where actually is the early work in computation geometry, I mean this random, uh, random sampling, was inspired by the work of learning theory and methods. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm just saying that you know, just based on universal, uh, sorry, uniform sampling, these kind of problems can be done. So let me not go, go through this at all. You know, I just skip to just there. Okay. Uh, let me go to my next example, which is less trivial than the next one. And that is how do you construct, uh, given a line set of line segments, and this problem is called the uh, trapezoid map, or sometimes called the vertical visibility map. So I have this set of line segments, okay? and if you draw vertical lines through the endpoints, okay, and extend it till it hits the next segment, okay, this induces basically a partition of the plane into this kind of trapezoid regions. This is called trapezoid maps. Okay. Of course, these are unbounded, so I can imagine the whole thing inside the box. So everything becomes bounded. So constructing this uh, relation, or basically a display the map, okay, is the problem of visibility, uh, vertical visibility or trapezoid maps. And uh, you know, it takes a certain time, or it's, it's very useful construction in, in geometric setting. So how do you construct the trapezoid map? So you can again think about the same idea of the <coughs> construction. What's the input? The input is a set of line segments. And what's the output? The output basically is this planar map, this description of the planar map. So, so the output is <coughs> like, you know, so I, I should know, like basically whatever is a planar map, you should know what the regions are, what the vertices are, and you know, what the edges are, what the faces are. So here these are the faces, you know, these are the vertices. Uh, that you know, are defined by the vertical lines uh, intersecting these, uh, these uh, line segments. So the description of this, this partition is the output, basically. And this is uh, very useful for visibility problems in particular triangulations. So if you can do this trapezoidal map efficiently, you can do triangulations. Of course, linear type triangulation is a big time of problem, so people have to thought that if they need to do this construction in linear time, and they got very close using that position, but not quite ordered it. They got to about n log star n, this the famous evolution there actually. Um, but you know, again, trapezoidal map construction, uh, you know, it, it's not in that very hard problem. It's like the n, uh, n log n kind of problem. It sort of solves n log n problem. We are not talking about you know, these hard problems in the sense of you know, the hardness. So most of the problems we are talking about are you know, very, very uh, polynomial time, you know, we are talking about how to do optimal constructions and how to do simple, this uh, you know, in a simple manner. So here also you can think about basically adding these line segments, okay, one after the other and uh, maintaining the partial construction. And finally when the last segment gets added, then the time. And the regions that you know, I have shaded here correspond to what is called this empty trapezoid, right? I mean, there's also a trapezoid, by the way, defined by this region. But this trapezoid is not that important because there is another uh, separate passing through this. So the, the ones that we're really interested in are this kind of trapezoid. They actually tell the construction. So we need to keep track of that. Uh, so as I said, you know, at some point, basically, you can say that we have uh, added all the red segments, so two segments are yet to be added. And this is the partial construction, right? So I have a uh, trapezoid defined by the red segments, and the blue segments are still are yet to be added, and when the blue segments get added, this trapezoid is going to split. Like, you know, in the fixed order, we add a pivot, it is also going to split. And we just incrementally update that information. So this whole relation on how do you maintain the sub-problems with the uh, set of points or other objects that define the sub-problem can be maintained, you know, in a kind of relation can be maintained as a bipartite graph, right? What are the objects and what are the configurations? So I said the configurations basically are the ones that define the sub-problems. In the case of quicksort, it is the uh, interval. In the case of tra uh, trapezoidal maps, it is those empty trapezoids. Uh, so, 
here I can think about the objects on the left hand side and the ranges which are the configurations that you have. And <coughs> I draw an edge between an object and a range if this object happens to intersect that edge. So that's a simple relation that we try to maintain. As you basically keep adding more and more objects, okay, the range in the second pages actually change and the relation supports gets really fine. So you have to update the relation. And finally, when the construction is over, you get the you know the the, the, the uh, object that we are looking for. So this this uh, this this relation of this bipartite graph contains the entire information about uh, the sorted objects or the trapezoidal map or whatever you mean. So as you keep adding objects, there are some modifications, right? So if some, as you add the next object, uh, some of the old configurations that trapezoids get deleted and some new trapezoids get added, right? So this is what is being depicted here. So something may get deleted, something may get created. So the red ones are getting deleted and uh, correspond to some deletions, you know, and something is getting created because uh, something got added. So essentially this diagram gets modified, or this graph gets modified, and we have to maintain, I mean, the algorithmic challenge here is to maintain this diagram in terms of the efficient. And the thing to notice is that, you know, I can think about the running time of these kind of algorithms as the work required to update this diagram. So at every step, there is a certain work that is getting up, uh, there is a certain work that is getting done which can be captured by the number of new images created and old images destroyed. So that's the cost, basically the structural change that is happening as I keep on adding objects. And I can actually ignore even the edges that are getting deleted because the edges can be deleted only once. So I can only keep track of the edges that get created when the next object gets added. So I'm calling it the amortized pause. The total amortized pause is basically the number of edges created in this object. I'm calling this as a content graph. It basically maintains the information between the objects and the subproblems. The subset of subproblems get keep changing as they add a new object. Some edges get created and deleted in this by graph, or what I'm calling the content graph. So content graph is a very simple data structure by which you can implement any of these you know, RIC uh, algorithms. So in the general step, basically, I have a random uh, set of objects that are added so far. This is the next object that is getting added. And both of them are random subsets. So you can think about this R as a random subset of size 1 less than that we right? It's a kind of a, a hierarchy of random subsets, basically, density subsets. And what we want to keep track of is the expected number of expected work, basically the expected number of edges created in the concrete graph when we add the next object, that is the S. So I'm saying S is the next object, that is the object that is getting added. And we just sum it over this whole thing. And this quantity L sub sigma is the set of objects or the size of the subproblems. Okay? So if a certain configuration, a subproblem gets affected. Okay. The amount of change is essentially the size of the problem. That defines the number of edges in the graph. So how many edges got created is basically, you know, can be captured in the expected sense by, by this that if this new subproblem belongs to the difference of the new set of configurations minus the old set of configurations, okay, what is the size of that? The probability of this times this, right? Summation of this basically is the expected work over uh, creating the, uh, sorry, adding the next object. And it can be shown using a nice technique for backward analysis that when there are, a, a, a subset is uh, defined by D objects, then it looks to be very intimidating, but actually there's a nice thing, which is saying that you know, my Subproblem is defined by D objects, and I'm adding the Rth object. The probability that a certain configuration gets changed is only this, and that basically simplifies the result. 
So don't look at the expression uh, too closely. But I'm just giving you a sense of you know, how this happens. And essentially, it's a you know an exemplary use of uh, linearity of expectation. And this work is the background that I'm giving. This is actually a very little bound to expect the kind of randomizing construction, not only for quicksort, okay, but like in just a general analysis, which gives a expected bound. So we are able to have this framework is so powerful that it is able to capture the expected running time for a whole variety of problems provided you can fit into this paper. Okay? And the expression that you get out of this is something like this D of sigma is the number of objects defined as a subject, which is usually a constant, okay, divided by R, okay, which is the size of the uh, Sorry, at the rh step. So this is the expression for the rh step. Then you sum it up over this, and you get this expression. And uh, so this expression will depend on the problem. But then you plug in the parameters, and basically you get out the analysis. Okay. This falls off. Okay. So uh, for something like you know quicksort or even a two-dimensional convex hull, you know. D is constant, you know, and you just you look at this expression, it's basically just a problem. It just pops up. So, expected running time for quick sort, expected running time for convex star, still use convex star, and many other problems is fall off. But it will not be n log n, it's n log n because of this expression. The expression will be different for different problems. However, what people are unable to work out in this general framework is the phase difference okay, or concentration of. So the expected running time was done with a very elaborate analysis, you know, you know the first people who did it, you know, really had to struggle, but later, you know, it was simplified to an extent that it's like a formula. So you just give me the problem, and I'll be able to fit in the, define the parameters, and I'll just extract the running time. What people are able to do is do concentration bounds for this. And when I say concentration bounds, I mean without independent implications. You can, of course, do many answers, I'll do them and claim that, you know, I can just improve the problem to this and So this is a very, very expectation-dependent analysis. As I said, it's an exemplary use of linearity of expectations on, on various fronts. Okay. So this is basically the background of this work that people try, but they did succeed for some specific problems. So for instance, you know, uh, which sort one could work out, uh, from which cells one could work out. So from ad hoc ways of you know, working out these bounds, but not the nice way or the general way that we expected to find that to work out. This is that conversation. Uh, there are other things that people are interested in, in, in the sample <coughs> case, that at the ith step, when I have thrown in i a, a random subset of i objects, the what I had required in that analysis, which I actually didn't want to get into too much, is, is, no, is known as basically the sum of the subproblem sizes. So let me quickly run into that. Okay. So when I look at a trapezoidal map, okay, the sum of the subproblems. So one thing I said is of interest is the number of blue segments that is contained within this trapezoid. Okay. So number of unadded objects, that's a subproblem. But if I add the size of the subproblems, and pro, sorry, sorry, the number of the size of subproblems over all subproblems. Then, for a problem like sorting, it's obvious that the total number of size of subproblems is n. It doesn't change. But then, for many geometric problems like this one, if this segment is getting split into two trapezoids, or this segment can run across many trapezoids. So that becomes a very important uh, calculation that you have to do in the analysis to show that that can be bound. So that is I'm referring to as the sum of the problem sizes. In fact, people were able to prove something even beyond that, which is the, the CF moment kind. It's not just the sum of the subproblem to the higher moments. What is the sum of the squares of the subproblems and so on? Sorry, you know, we just don't bother to read these things. So finally, basically what I'm saying is that you know the probability distribution of the running time. Okay, we have a very good handle on the expectation, but uh, not on the concentration bounds, and which is basically what was the motivation for this problem. 
So people use these scientific <coughs> things like Jalal bombs, Jalal bombs, cause fish bombs. Here somehow, you know, only in the ad hoc sense, in some of the problems it could be done. They not need. So we wanted to basically show that the expected running time, uh, uh, you know, uh, so that, that, sorry, the, one should be able to prove that the actual running time does not deviate from the expected running time by more than a constant factor with uh, inverse polynomial problem. This is the kind of result basically we So here is a framework where um, they want to use basically to do the analysis. And it is also not uh, really, uh, very uh, difficult to think of, you know, uh, in this kind of constructions, you know, a particle framework, you know, uh, gives you good problems, known for many problems. So it's just that, you know, the right kind of uh, you know, the setup and the right kind of uh, probabilistic inquiry have to be used for so that's what you know this is about. Uh, this work is about. So, uh, so here what I'm saying is that you know you look at so I'm looking at basically the all possible permutations spanning these objects, right? So here is my permutation space essentially. Okay, all possible permutations. And we have uniform uh, probability distribution of the permutations, all permutations in that. Okay. And then I'm going to look at a certain stage of the algorithm as if I fix the prefix, that is I have chosen a fixed set of objects as the first i objects, then what happens? What is the expected time? Given that I do. So it's kind of some kind of a conditional probability setup. So for instance, if I have three objects, okay, initially all these permutations are equal like so that's B0. Then if I choose the first object, okay, then I'm restricted, so in the next, if I block these permutations, then I'm restricted to this one, then I'm restricted to these two permutations. If I've chosen two, then I'm restricted to these two permutations. If I've chosen three, then I'm restricted to these two permutations. Okay? So as we basically go on, you know, you are exposing more and more of the next object that is planned. Right? That's the typical way that you know these exposure particles work. And finally, basically the whole thing is revealed, and that's basically the running time. So for a fixed set, fixed sequence of addition, the running time. Initially, you know, all permutations are possible. So I can define this random variable as, you know, what is the expectation? So let us say the z is the running time, or let us say the, uh, the, uh, the structural changes that we keep track in the concrete graph. Okay? So given a fixed prefix, okay, what is the expected running time? That's how I will define z running time. And ZI turns out to be a module. It's satisfied and it is very fact, very easy. And it is a module that you can basically do this So so this is how it is set up. So given a fixed prefix, what is the expected running time? Right? Initially, of course, nothing is known, so Z0 basically corresponds to the expected running time of the value of the construction. And finally, ZN corresponds to a specific sequence of addition. And we want to get a handle on this case. Probability the deviation from the expected running time and the actual running time. We want to say that the probability that it exceeds that by the sum. That's what is called. And that's where these multiple you know, inequalities are used. And the specific inequality I use called the Friedman's inequality. Okay? The Friedman's inequality is basically uses, it's called the method of bounded variance. Okay? Rather than the method of bounded difference. And uh, so the crucial parameters, you know, don't read that one, that is part of something. The crucial parameters, so this is the basic inequality. Yn minus y0 exceeding lambda is less than this one. And here, the two things, this is basically related to the variance. Okay, this is called the bounded, uh, bounded variance method. And this is basically, at any step, what is the maximum change that happens? So this is very technical, but this is the finally the inequality that basically has uh, needed some improved results. So this is the extended Friedman inequality where I'm saying that I may not be able to actually get a deterministic bound of the variance and the maximum change, but even if it holds with a certain probability, I just add that. Okay? So this bound will hold probably where the variance, so this is the variance part, and this is the 
the maximum change in the step, as long as the hold is a certain point. And you can contrast it to the more better, more complex Azuma Hauti for examples, where you know this is what what this is a very popular part for particles. So this is the difference that here I have the sum of mi square and that that is the maximum. And I have some variance term here, I don't have the variance term here. So incidentally, you know, even the last paper on this topic about 25 years ago did use a multiple-based axis, it's been on three wells, and they were able to make some progress, but you know, their derivation was, you know, I would say quite complicated and complex. And also there was a lot of ad hocness about it, so it was only applicable in certain situations. <coughs> so now quick sort, uh, what is that? So as we go from as we keep adding these intervals, okay, I will I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you get an idea of how the, the, those inequalities are applied. So, I, I look at it from the perspective of the fixed element index. So, when the next pivot gets added, look at the pers from the perspective of this element, either it belongs to an interval that. Uh, so, I'm um, running so it in the reverse direction. Sorry. So, so, it's just like basically I'm, I'm deleting it. So, Maybe I should have mentioned that you know running the algorithm in the forward direction and the backward direction is the same. So sometimes it's easier to think about it. And so I'm kind of running the backward direction. So I'm taking away basically the pivots rather than adding them. So it's the same analysis basically. The overall total amount of work you may see. So when I deleted this element, this element was not affected at all because only this interval is not quantified. Right? So when we add a pivot, basically from the perspective of a fixed element, either it is affected or not affected. If it is affected, okay, then we charge the element for it. So for instance, you know, if uh, yeah, right. so I think this uh, so this body is needed. So these five elements basically have to be now uh, reallocated to the intervals. Okay. So the total cost of phi is equally shared between each of them. So I'm basically doing the amortization over here. So every step, basically, either element gets affected or it doesn't. Okay. So that is the maximum change that can happen for the first of an element, and then I can sum over all elements and take a this amount. So this is the indicator random variable saying that if the interval between the exchanges, then <coughs> accrues a cost of 1 and 0. And when you do the analysis, basically, the expectation of this quantity turns out to be 2 over g. Why? Because at the j step, okay, the probability basically when something changes, okay, so there are j elements. So only if one of the uh, one of the uh, elements define the interval changes, only then this gets changed. Okay. So at the j step, okay. There are only two elements for which this is going to get affected. So that turns out to be basically this quantity 2 over j, and you add it over all j, it becomes log n. So for each element, it becomes log n. So the expected bound is basically log n. And m of n is the maximum change that can happen from the single element. And then you can do some calculations of the variance, okay, and you can show that basically the variance can also be bounded by log And then you plug in that. Uh, uh, three times bound, uh, and you can get this inverse of the uh, Just to make a note that you know this kind of analysis can be done even without particles, just by using channel bounds and doing some more careful analysis. So this is known; it's not an issue. Uh, it's just that use of particles reduce the number of random bits. Okay, and of course, if you try to use Azuma Hauti here, you will not will succeed because this is too high. Now every time we can we start it cost of 1, this adds up to n, then basically you get nothing this. Okay. Uh, for the more complicated things, okay, uh, this is regarding triangulation. Regarding triangulation is you know, the kind of triangulation where uh, it's a rule of the Bornoi diagram, where the disc containing 
this triangle is not containing any other point. So if I do this double triangulation also in the same manner in print construction, okay. So what's the difference in the big sort? So as I said, you know, there are more complex scenarios. So here when I add uh, a single element, okay, there could be a lot of changes. That is, something like this basically can change into this, right? So so many triangles are affected, okay, rather than as a post quick sort where exactly one interval was split into two. So here this is not known. In fact, it can be as bad as order i in the i stage. So that brings in additional complexity. And but what you can argue about is that the average degree of the planar graph is one. So in the expected sense, the number of subproblems getting affected is constant. But it is no longer bounded like the way the quick sort is. Okay? So this is another scenario. And then if you Another problem, you know, is this case of light segment intersection where you want to find out all the pairwise intersection of a real set of n segments, which is can be as large as n square. But the ideal running time of this algorithm is basically uh, the number of intersections plus n log. Now here, I'm going to again maintain the same kind of trapezoidal map, where the trapezoidal map will not only just pass to endpoint, but also to the inter intersection. So eventually, when I have when I construct the full trapezoidal map, I also move this. That's the way to do But here, there is an additional complication even beyond what is on a triangulation. That is, even the size of the intermediate structure is not known. If the size of the intermediate structure in the case of big sort is always i plus 1. In the case of Delaunay triangulation, you have a, you know that the maximum change can the expectation is bounded by constant. But here, you know, it can have a huge variance because if you look at this picture, the red segments don't intersect at all, the blue segments intersect. So if I choose only the red segments, the number of trapezoids will be far smaller than if I chose the blue segments. So that creates the additional problem. Okay? And uh, ideal bound is this. So people have used this kind of approach to get again a handle on the expected running time. So this is all, overall kind of summary of you know, what I could achieve using plugging in this, this, this bounds, the multiple bounds. Uh, but not, I don't think I have time to go through the lower bound construction. But uh, finally, basically, the lower bound construction establishes that uh, this, uh, that you can act, you can't actually get, I don't have a statement here. Uh, yeah, so that you can actually, so this is, a, this, is a, this is actually a negative result. So you, can, you can't get a gross polynomial bound for maintaining this uh, trapezoidal map because you can exceed n <coughs> log n the ideal bound types of log n factors and it can hold with a pretty high probability that it's not less than 1 over n but it can be a, actually something like, sorry, something like 1 over 2 n. Okay, so that's the uh, negative result. Uh, <coughs> so future directions is that, you know, uh, I have limited success, okay, but it's still open for the early time. It's very important that you know we get we can find the uh, the concentration bounds for the lower time, which is little lower time. And or else you move the lower bounds, get some more lower bounds to show that actually you can't hope to match the expected running time. Okay. And but it can actually depend. So there will not be the lower bound. That uh, that's what I suspect now. That depending on the problem, it, you may have to look at some classes. Okay, okay. especially. I could get a lower bound easily for the case uh, for where you know it's the sum of the subproblem sizes is not bound. But the sum of subproblem sizes is bound, it's harder to get a lower bound. So it can actually depend on this equation. So that's it. Sorry, I can have this video. Ranges are uh, polynomially many. So the whole uh, theory of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the RIC, the bound, the little bound, uh, requires uh, you know a, a polynomial bound on the number of problems. So those uh, epsilon uh, net kind of bound bounds require the bounded dimension, which implies actually the geometric setting polynomial number of the reason I ask is also correction in geometry. So there is this paper by Mustafa and Ray where they 
come up with B classes for heating sets, mm -hmm. when this bipartite graph that you pointed out mm -hmm. is actually a planar bipartite graph. So one of the persons is here who can probably throw some more light on it. Thank <laughs> you. 